Well, actually, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started so that we have as much time as possible for questions today. Uh, Shalom Aleichem, greetings and welcome to the next in Chicago YIVO Society's series of online programs. So it's a huge pleasure and honor for us and for me particularly to welcome a very great scholar of French and Jewish literature and history and a Chicago native, Professor Maurice Samuels of Yale University. With today's talk, we will travel to Western Europe and let Maury take us into a fascinating and little known period and moment in both French and Jewish history that he has uncovered and brought to life vividly in his 2020 book, The Betrayal of the Duchess that you see here on the screen. It's a story of political intrigue and betrayal that also opens up reflection all too relevant today on how anti-Semitism moved to the center of modern politics in France and also in Europe. Before I introduce Professor Samuels, I'm going to refer to as Maury and have the pleasure of uh, calling a longtime friend and acquaintance. I want quickly to thank all of you uh, here who have helped us bring this program and others uh, on Zoom through your generous donations to the Chicago YIVO Society, both uh, donations of money and time. Chicago YIVO is a small all volunteer aff affiliate of the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research in New York. Our goal is to bring programming on Yiddish and Jewish culture to the Chicago area. And now we're happy that we have attendees from other parts of the globe and the country. If you're able and interested, please feel free to uh, join others and shoot us a donation of any size at all through our website, uh, chicagoyuvo.org. Oh, thank you, Tom, which is now in the chat. And if you might've forgotten, feel free to open up the chat. And during our talk, feel free to type in questions that we'll have plenty of time for questions after Maury's talk. And if you, if it comes to your mind, feel free to type your question in already so that you don't forget it. And I have it accessible there and can call on you. Um, I'll ask people who know how to do that to type their questions in the chat, or you can write, I have a question and I'll look through who's, who's done that so that I can call on you. Or if you know how to uh, raise your hand using the, um, that function, go ahead and raise your hand during the Q&A session. And um, anyway, if you, if you are able to jump on and make a uh, donation, you can help us keep bringing more programs like today's. And I wanna thank Maury for taking your Sunday to join us and open up this story and introduce us to um, the kind of work that you do illuminating how integral Jewish life and culture have been to the formation of modern France. So Maury Samuels is coming to us from the East Coast where he's Betty Jane Amlian Professor of French at Yale University, chair of the Judaic Studies Program, and also director of the Yale Program for the Study of Anti-Semitism, one of the only academic programs in the US dedicated to studying forms of anti-Semitism, both historical and contemporary. Working at the intersection of uh, Jewish studies and French literature, Maury is a specialist in the literature and culture of 19th century France and also a Guggenheim Fellowship recipient among other awards. He has written four fascinating and groundbreaking books today. The Betrayal of the du Duchess, the one that we're looking at now is, was published in 2020. It's an exciting narrative that to my mind reflects in some ways Maury's early years spent reviewing Hollywood scripts. <laughs> it, reads, it, it, it reads like a, um, a page turner. Uh, before that, The Right to Difference, French Universalism and the Jews, in which he studies the way French writers and thinkers have conceived of the place of Jews within the nation from the French Revolution to the present. Uh, before that, Inventing the Israelite, Jewish fiction in 19th century France, which brings to light um, some of the first Jewish fiction writers in French. And before that, The Spectacular Past, Popular History and the Novel in 19th Century France. Um, and I won't take any more time here, but um, uh, congratulations to Maury, um, who is departing soon for France, where the right to difference will be released in French as Le droit à la différence. Maury, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. I'm going to try to operate the slideshow for you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Karen. Um, it's it's really exciting uh, to be here and to um, see such an old friend. And also thanks to Tom and to Jake and everyone at YIVO uh, who made this possible. Um, I'm really happy to uh, have a chance to, to talk about my book with you all. So this is a book about an extraordinary woman, a very determined four foot seven duchess who led a civil war to reconquer the French throne for the Bourbons in 1832. 
It's also about the man who betrayed her, who was the son of France's chief rabbi. And it's about the firestorm of hatred against Jews that the betrayal unleashed, which I argue was the first real outpouring of anti-Semitism in modern France and set the stage for the Dreyfus affair some 60 years later. So I'm going to start today by telling the story, which shocked me when I first came across it about a decade ago while doing research for a different book. Uh, I'll then discuss what the betrayal has to teach us about the origins of modern anti-Semitism, and I'll conclude by giving a sense of how the story has been remembered or not remembered, forgotten, I guess, uh, over the past 200 years. Then we'll open it up for questions, um, and I think the, the case raises a lot of them. Uh, so Karen, if you'll go to the next slide. Mm. The Duchesse de Berry was born Maria Carolina Ferdinanda Luisa de Borbone in 1798 in Naples, the granddaughter of its king. In 1816, she married her older distant cousin, and we'll go to the next slide, um, the Duc de Berry, the playboy nephew of the French king Louis XVIII, and she came to France just as the Bourbon Restoration was getting underway. Now, the Bourbons had returned to power in France after the fall of Napoleon in first 1814, and then Napoleon came back, and, and finally in 1815. Uh, and the Bourbons immediately tried to set back the clock to pretend like the French Revolution had never taken place. Aristocrats recovered their fortunes and political power, as did the Catholic Church, which the Bourbon monarchy saw as a crucial ally in its efforts to restore traditional social values along with traditional power structures in France. As the youngest and most glamorous member of the Bourbon royal family, the Duchesse de Berry played a key role in helping to, hide, to brighten the Bourbon's stodgy, mournful image. Thanks to her flair for fashion, lavish parties, and patronage of the arts, the young Duchess immediately became the toast of Paris. And in portraits of her from the era, and if we go to the next slide, um, here's a famous one by Thomas Lawrence. Uh, she has very blonde hair, very pale skin, and a left eye that wanders slightly as if on the lookout for excitement. In 1820, after only a few years of marriage, her husband was assassinated during a trip to the opera by a radical anti-monarchist, and he bled to death in her arms. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see... Um, an image of the Duke's deathbed uh, scene in the foyer of the opera. Uh, this was one of many similar images that circulated across France and helped make the Duchess a martyr for the royalist cause, much like her guillotined great aunt, Marie Antoinette. Since there were no other Bourbons capable of producing children, the assassin believed that he had ended the French royal bloodline once and for all. But the Duchess shocked the nation by revealing at her husband's deathbed that she was, in fact, two months pregnant. Despite rumors that she was faking and attempts to set off firecrackers outside her window at the Tuileries Palace to scare her into a miscarriage, seven months after the assassination, the Duchess did indeed give birth to a son, Henri, dubbed the Miracle Child. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll see uh, a picture of the Duchess and her son, L'Enfant du Miracle, uh, from a few years later. So royalists credited the Duchess with saving the Bourbon monarchy, and the young widow's stock rose considerably in France in the 1820s, her position as mother of the heir to the throne, giving her standing within the French royal family, where she was engaged in a kind of power struggle with her childless and disapproving sister-in-law, the Duchesse d'Angoulême. And if we go to the next slide, uh, We'll see her, um, the Duchesse d'Angoulême, who sought to push their mutual father-in-law, the king, the new king, Charles X, in an increasingly reactionary direction. 
When another revolution broke out in 1830, caused mainly by the reactionary policies of uh, Charles X and the Duchesse d'Angoulême, the Duchesse de Berry, alone among the Bourbon royal family, wanted to stay and fight. Appearing before the king, her father-in-law, in a man's riding outfit with a pair of pistols dangling from her belt, the duchess begged for permission to go to the far western province of the Vendée, long seen as a hotbed of conservative Catholicism and royalism in order to stir up a counter-revolutionary army against Louis Philippe, who was the cousin of the Bourbons uh, from the rival Orléans branch of the royal family, and who was about to be crowned king of the French by the revolutionaries. The soon-to-be ex-king, Charles X, refused her plea, and she reluctantly joined the mournful cortege of her Bourbon in-laws as they made their way to England for yet another exile. But while Charles X and the Duchesse d'Angoulême licked their wounds in the drafty Scottish castle of Holyrood, the Duchesse de Berry immediately began scheming to recapture the throne for her son. Leaving Henri and his older sister behind in England, she made her way to Italy, assuming a series of disguises and false names in order to elude the agents of Louis Philippe, who were in fact monitoring her every move. In the fall of 1831, from the small Tuscan town of Massa on the coast, uh, she gathered around her a close band of conspirators. And for the most part, she chose her, her associates, her conspirators well. Drawn from some of the highest aristocratic families in France, they were all willing to die for her cause. She made only one miscalculation though, and it would prove her undoing. Uh, let's go to the next slide. At first glance, Simon Deutz might seem a surprising choice to become the trusted confidant of the Duchess. He was a humble commoner and an immigrant. Born in Koblenz, Germany in 1802, he moved to Paris as a child and had worked as a printer's apprentice, so not the type to normally associate with royalty. But even more improbably, he had been born a Jew. In any previous century, his itinerary would have been all but unthinkable. But Simon was born at a time of unprecedented social change for France in general and for Jews in particular. In 1790 and 91, during the early days of the French Revolution, France became the first modern European nation to grant full civil rights to the Jews. The revolution opened new possibilities for Jews to transform themselves, to join mainstream society, to rise up economically and socially while remaining Jews, or for that matter, to leave Judaism behind. Many Jews of Simon's generation, the first to be born as French citizens, took advantage of these opportunities to invent new identities for themselves. It's safe to say, though, I think, that almost nobody sought so complete a change as Simon Deutz. Now, Simon was not just any Jew. As I said at the start, he was the son of France's chief rabbi, Emmanuel Deutz. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see the dad. Uh, Emmanuel was born in 1763. Uh, he became a rabbi in Koblenz, a town on the bank of the Rhine in the Palatinate, one of the German states that Napoleon conquered on his march eastward. When Napoleon's troops entered the town of Koblenz in 1794, they tore down the gate which kept the Jewish population locked in a ghetto and gave the region's Jews the same rights that the revolution had granted to Jews in France a few years before. A decade later, in 1806, when the now Emperor Napoleon convened a body of Jewish notables, which he grandiosely dubbed the Grand Sanhedrin after the ancient rabbinical court, Emmanuel Deutz made his way to Paris to form part of this august body, which Napoleon charged with laying down the limits of Jewish religious law and sanctioning the integration of Judaism into the imperial state. 
After the Sanhedrin disbanded, Emmanuel Deutz was asked to stay on in Paris as one of the three chief rabbis of France. And after his two colleagues departed a couple of years later, he remained as the sole chief rabbi, the religious and administrative head of French Judaism. So Emmanuel Deutz settled his large family in the Marais, then as now the center of Parisian Jewish life. A modest man who never fully learned French and continued to deliver sermons in his native Yiddish, Rabbi Deutz was beloved by the poor and traditional Jews who made up the majority of the Parisian Jewish population in the early decades of the 19th century. However, he was disliked by the modernizers, those ambitious Jews who had begun to take advantage of the new possibilities opened by the French Revolution to climb the social and economic ladder. This hostility would turn into an all-out war a few years after his son, Simon, scandalized the community uh, by betraying the Duchess. And I'd be happy to come back um, to that war in the question period, since in part the conflict turned over the use of Yiddish. Uh, so Simon was a restless, troubled youth. Unable to settle down, he tried multiple professions, studying to become a rabbi in Germany before giving that up to become a printer and dabbling at various other enterprises, none successfully. But he was not the first member of the family to create a scandal. David Drach, uh, the, or Dachak, as you would say in French, the husband of Simon's eldest sister, Sarah, who was the director of the Jewish school in Paris and was widely seen as a likely candidate to succeed his father-in-law as chief rabbi, abruptly converted to Catholicism in 1823 and secretly baptized his children as well. Shocked by her husband's actions, Sarah Drac managed to disappear with the children to England, where her husband eventually tracked her down, kidnapped the children, and secreted them away in Catholic institutions back in France, as he made a career for himself as a Catholic theologian, specializing in exhorting his fellow Jews to convert. Nobody in the Deutz family reacted with more outrage to Drac's conversion than Simon, his brother-in-law, who undertook a campaign to harass him that lasted for several years until Simon himself suddenly decided to convert to Catholicism in 1828. Now, any Jew who converted in early 19th century France gained notoriety. There were only about five conversions a year between 1815 and 1848, at a time when the Jewish population of the capital grew to more than 10,000 people. But Simon's conversion created an enormous scandal because of his father's position as chief rabbi of France. This was exactly what uh, Simon had banked on, in fact, hoping to use his abjuration to attract the attention of prominent church officials and aristocrats who could help lift him out of poverty and obscurity. And his plan worked. Indeed, so big a stir did his conversion create that Simon was invited to Rome, where the Pope put him on the payroll of the Holy See. And it was Gregory XVI himself who recommended Deutz to the Duchesse de Berry as someone she could trust as she plotted to launch her civil war to reconquer the French throne for her son. A better recommendation would have been hard to find. All through 1831, the Duchess and her lieutenants watched as the political situation in France deteriorated. They were trying to determine the best moment to launch their campaign to reconquer the throne. And let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so Louis Philippe was not popular. Uh, here's a caricature from the time comparing his head to a pear uh, that could be found on walls all over Paris in 1831. But in, and in fact, he did kind of, his jowls did make him look a little pear-like. Um, but in the spring of 1832, the king's popularity took a nosedive thanks to a pandemic of cholera that ravaged the country. 
20,000 people died in Paris over the course of just a few months, and discontent with Louis Philippe reached quite literally a fever pitch. A left-wing revolt in the spring of 1832, which the government easily put down, is now remembered mainly as the climax to Victor Hugo's novel Les Miserables, but almost nobody remembers today that this was also the moment that the Duchesse de Berry chose to launch her revolution from the right. She set sail from Italy to Marseille in May of 1832. When the uprising that she had timed to coincide with her arrival in Marseille fizzled, the Duchess turned her sights on the province of the Vendée, donning a series of increasingly outlandish disguises in order to make her way unobserved from the southern coast of France to the far west of the country. But a series of miscommunications doomed her insurrection. When the first battle finally took place, government troops easily routed the Bourbon loyalists. Though they fought bravely in later skirmishes, the Duchess's soldiers were on the run by summer 1832. Needing time to regroup, the Duchess sought refuge in the far western town of Nantes, hiding out with several of her closest supporters in the attic of the house of the Du Guigny sisters. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, who were ardent legitimists as the supporters of the Bourbon monarchy had begun to call themselves in opposition to the so-called illegitimate monarchy of Louis Philippe. And this is the house uh, where the Duchess hid, at least how it looks today. So I, I took this picture, but I think it's, it's pretty similar. And she was hiding out in the attic. Simon Deutz, meanwhile, began to waver in his commitment to the Duchess. After acting as her emissary to the kings of Spain and Portugal, Deutz offered his services to Adolphier, Louis Philippe's Minister of the Interior, promising to lead government agents to where the Duchess was hiding. Deutz arrived in Nantes in October 1832, and after a few weeks courting the local legitimists, he managed to arrange a meeting with the Duchess at her secret hideaway in the attic of this house uh, on the evening of November 6th, 1832. Not wanting to miss this opportunity of capturing the Duchess, the government stationed 1,200 troops, two entire army regiments outside the house. As soon as Deutz exited from his interview, the police burst through the door. However, the Duchess was nowhere to be found. At the first sign of the raid, she and three accomplices had slipped into a tiny compartment behind the fireplace in the attic, where they stayed hidden for 16 hours while the police ransacked the house. And if we go to the next slide, we have a picture of the attic, and you'll see at the bottom there's a map um, with the tiny compartment, the little trapezoidal space that's shaded in. The Duchess, and so behind that, that fireplace in the corner that you can see. So um, the Duchess and her fellow outlaws held their breath and tried not to move as the police settled into the attic for the night. Now, November is a cold month in Nantes, um, and eventually the police uh, decided to light a fire in the room, filling the secret compartment with smoke and rendering its walls burning hot. The Duchess's dress caught fire at several points. Um, finally, though, the outlaws could stand it no more, and they crawled out through the fireplace grate. To the shock of the soldiers, the tiny soot-covered female military leader summoned her most regal bearing and declared, I am the Duchesse de Berry. You are French soldiers. I entrust myself to your honor. And if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see a uh, popular print, one of many from the time, showing that dramatic scene of the Duchess and her accomplices crawling out of the fireplace. Uh, in reality, though, they were in fact um, burned and covered with soot. When the news of her arrest hit Parisian papers the following day, Louis Philippe and his ministers found themselves in a tricky position. There was pressure from the left-wing advocates of a republic to put the Duchess on trial for leading a civil war. 
But convicting her could prove even more dangerous than letting her go free. Her imprisonment or execution for treason would turn her into a martyr for the right-wing legitimist cause. So the government of Louis-Philippe kept the royal widow locked up at the citadel of Bly for months where they, while they tried to decide what to do. If we go to the next slide, you'll see um, the house. Um, there's the house at the citadel where the Duchess was imprisoned. Louis-Philippe had scored a major victory in capturing the fugitive Duchess, but he didn't realize at the time just how major. At the moment of her arrest, the widowed Duchess was three months pregnant. Now, as the leader of a party devoted to traditional Catholicism, she faced humiliation and the end of her political ambitions once her illegitimate pregnancy was made known. Although the legitimist papers kept denying the pregnancy to the very end, the Duchess gave birth in prison in May of 1833. The government made sure the birth itself took place in full view of the public so the partisans of the Duchess couldn't suppress it. Hours after delivery, she released the name of the father, an obscure Italian count whom everyone knew she had not seen in years or perhaps ever, although the Vatican came through with a backdated marriage certificate that legitimized the child. While she saved a measure of face through this maneuver, Louis-Philippe triumphed. The Duchess effectively ceased to play a political role in France after the scandal. She passed the rest of her life in exile in Austria and Italy, and the Bourbons never did regain the French throne. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, that's the Duchess as an old woman. She died uh, in exile in 1870. Simon Deutz, meanwhile, became infamous. Although he would claim in his self-justifying memoir published in 1835 that he had turned in the Duchess to save France from civil war, he re received the enormous sum of 500,000 francs for the deed. Um, and if we go to the next slide, uh, you'll see a receipt in his hand contained in the papers of Adolphe Thiers, the Minister of the Interior. And just to give you an idea, 500,000 francs was really a lot of money. The average middle class family could live on 2,000 francs a year at the time. Within a few years, though, Simon had blown through the money, probably on gambling. Uh, the government eventually gave him a small allowance, provided he would leave the country, and he seems to have died under a false name in New Orleans in 1844, his real name remaining a synonym for treason in France until at least the end of the 19th century. Although I'm happy to come back in the questions to my doubts about whether he definitely did die in New Orleans. That, that's one of the remaining mysteries that I wasn't totally able to resolve. Um, so Karen, we could stop the slides here. That's the end of the slideshow. And I'll just say a few more words about um, what I think this all means uh, for the development of anti-Semitism in France. So uh, a handful of recent historians have studied the Duchess, focusing mainly on her role in 19th century French politics. However, few scholars have explored in detail her relationship with Deutz and the episode of the betrayal, and it's not hard to see why. Unlike Alfred Dreyfus, the Jewish officer who was falsely accused of treason in the 1890s and who represents a kind of model victim of anti-Semitism, or at least a blameless one, Deutz is a pretty unsavory character, an opportunist, a narcissist, and a liar. And unlike Dreyfus, Deutz was actually guilty of betrayal, even if his crime doesn't amount to treason against France as the Duchess's right-wing supporters alleged. But in my book, I suggest that his case is nevertheless important to examine because it represents a turning point in the way that Jews were imagined and represented in France. So many scholars have described how Jews became scapegoats for the resentments bred by the upheaval that followed from the political and economic revolutions of the 19th century. 
Much of this scholarship, though, has focused on the end of the 19th century, the 1880s and 1890s, the period in which anti-Semitism became a potent political force. But it was actually in the early 19th century that the old religious and economic forms of Jew hatred, which had marked French life for centuries prior to the French Revolution, mutated into something more modern. I argue in this book that the story of the betrayal of the Duchesse de Berry brought these resentments into focus and into the mainstream of French public discourse. I show how all the right-wing newspapers at the time, and there were dozens, saw the betrayal in anti-Semitic terms. They not only denounced Deutz as a Jew, even though he had technically converted to Catholicism, but they saw his betrayal as a function of his Jewishness. Indeed, one of the reasons that the French Jewish community turned on Rabbi Deutz uh, after the, the scandal was that they feared there would be a pogrom if they didn't. The story of the betrayal ignited anti-Semitic passions, I argue, because its two main characters, the Duchess and Deutz, seemed like such clear embodiments of the opposing poles in the conflict over France's modernization. Those left behind by political and economic changes, so declining aristocrats, disgruntled peasants, but also some disaffected petit bourgeois, saw the Duchess as a kind of secular saint, someone who stood for loyalty to the traditional French values of church and throne, and whose doomed civil war against Louis Philippe seemed like a noble form of resistance to the forces that were reshaping France. These forces were perfectly embodied by Deutz, the crossing of borders, the violation of traditional class hier hierarchies, the lack of fidelity to religion, country, or cause, and most of all, the greed, the willingness to betray his God and his party for money, which many associated with the new capitalist system. Deutz, the immigrant Jew, became the emblem of everything that was scary and bad about the modern era that the revolution of 1789 had inaugurated and the revolution of 1830 had exacerbated. I argue in the book that the affair of Deutz and the Duchess was the crucial moment when the terms of modern anti-Semitism coalesced in France. Now, this is not to say that many of its elements were not already present in European discourse earlier than 1832. We see a new proto-socialist anti-Semitism in the writing, for instance, of Charles Fourier and others from the early 1800s. And there was already a hint of racialized discourse on Jews in the early decades of the century as well. But the betrayal of the Duchess was the first time the Jews would take on the full range of meanings that they would have for later anti-Semites. It was the first time that the Jew was given a face in France. And I'm happy in the question period to come back to that visual image of Deutz, because in many senses it became the face of the Jew. And it was the moment that anti-Semitism became a cultural code for the right wing, a way of expressing their cultural and political identity. I suggest in the book that the betrayal set the stage for the Dreyfus affair 60 years later. When the army discovered that there was a traitor in its midst in 1894, suspicion soon fell on Dreyfus, a Jew. This was because Dreyfus would fit a familiar pattern, a lineage of treachery inaugurated by Judas and reactivated by Deutz. Thanks to all the writers who kept the legend of Deutz alive throughout the 19th century, not just rabid anti-Semites like Edouard Drummond, but also supposed liberals like Victor Hugo, who was also obsessed with the case. Because of these writers, the traitor could only be a Jew and the Jew could only be a traitor. History seemed to repeat itself during the Dreyfus Affair because the story of Deutz was still so familiar. In other words, the story of Deutz and the Duchess determined or overdetermined how the Dreyfus Affair played out. And the story of the betrayal surfaced again during World War II. As the Nazis and their French accomplices began to round up Jews and send them to concentration camps, 
fascist journalists in France once again resurrected the story of Deutz's treachery to justify their actions. In the book, I show how there was a huge increase in mentions of the case in the press during World War II. The story would largely fade from historical memory in the post-war years, however, uh, when overt anti-Semitism in France became taboo. Aside from a few mentions in scholarly articles, many of them trying to excuse Deutz or even argue wrongly that he was innocent, almost nobody has written about the case since the 1940s. Even specialists of French Jewish history I know had never heard of it. By reviving the case now, I'm therefore taking a calculated risk. Uh, as the director of an academic program for the study of anti-Semitism, I'm all too aware of the hazards of discussing the greed-motivated betrayal by an immigrant Jew at a time when anti-Semitism is once again on the rise in France and even the United States. But I believe it is vital to revisit this case now, not in spite of resurgent anti-Semitism, but because of it. Analyzing the betrayal of the Duchess enables us to understand how the various assumptions that continue to govern attitudes toward Jews first crystallized into a political ideology. Simon Deutz really did betray the Duchesse de Berry, but the myth that took shape around the betrayal turned it into something much larger than a historical anecdote. The betrayal, I argue, became a way of channeling popular frustrations with change. By revealing how this myth developed, we come to understand better what was at stake and what I think continues to be at stake when legitimate grievances find illegitimate targets. Only by examining our cultural myths in the bright light of history do we deprive them of power. And I'll, I'll stop there and um, open it up to questions. All right, thank you. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, yes, Jeffrey's using the, um, the, the the clapping function, which you're all welcome to find. I'm going to ask, I have so many questions, but important for us is that the people who are visiting here get a chance to ask theirs. So um, for those of you who came late, while I ask a few initial questions of my own, please feel free to write in the chat area. And if you go to the bottom of your screen and hover your pointer, you'll get a bar of options. And one of them is chat. And if you click on that, you can type in there and say, please call on me, I have a question, or you can type your question. If you know how to use the uh, functions, um, you could put your hand up as well. And um, I'm gonna ask for help because there are so many screens of people from Tom to scan around and see if there are any hands up while I'm, while I'm calling on people. Okay, great, all right, so let's jump right in more. This is just such a crucial, moment in the genealogy of, of modern anti-Semitism. And uh, it's incredible that it was not talked about. You've kind of explained some of the reasons why it became a taboo and it has to do with the discomfort around the fact that this is not a heroic figure. Um, and so how did you find this? There's a little bit about how, you know, this is an amazing discovery. How did you find it? Um, what kind of sources did you use and what did it feel like to make the decision to write about an unsavory Jewish character? Yeah, um, so I, I think I mentioned that that I came upon the case when I was um, writing the my second book about the first Jewish fiction writers in France. And I can still remember the day when I was sitting in um, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, so the French National Library, and I was researching one of those um, early French Jewish fiction writers with this guy named Godchaux, Vey Weil, um, who wrote under the pen name Ben Levy. And he was this kind of child prodigy um, in uh, the 1820s. And his tutor was the brother-in-law, David Drack. Um, so his father, the, this writer's father was a prominent member of the Jewish community and had hired David Drack um, to tutor his son. And I started to just like look into Drac and I came across that story of how he converted and then kidnapped his children and the whole thing, you know, I like went down this, this total rabbit hole for a week in the library and I had like, you know, limited amount of time to research the book that I was actually writing and I had to painfully 
put this aside and say to myself, like, I've got to come back to this um, because like, it's, it's like this incredible story. Um, and I did, it, I and wrote did. another book in between, but I, I came back um, uh, to it eventually. And um, yeah, so you part, asked about like the- Yeah, the, part of that question was your decision, uh, what it feel like to, to decide to write about and, and bring back uh, an unsavory Jewish character. Yeah, um, right, because, I mean, there, there are really like two sides to that question because, you know, as I went into it, I was, um, I would say I was kind of determined not to like the Duchess, um, you know, who's this right wing figure. And, you know, I wrote this in the Trump years um, and it became really fascinating to kind of like, focus on someone who became like this right wing heroine, you know, this person who people projected all of their fears and desires onto. And she really played an almost Trump-like role. That said, as I was writing the book, she was kind of an amazing person, you know? And so that was kind of a challenge. Like this person who had really bad politics as far as I was concerned, who was this, you know, like reactionary, you know, um, although she was not actually an anti-Semite, which was interesting, but, um, you know, but she did, she was, she, you know, was very right wing and, but in her own life challenged all these kind of right wing assumptions. So, you know, she, was like a cross-dressing female military hero at a time when, you know, nobody did those things. So she, I became kind of like fascinated by her. And one of the challenges in running the book was to kind of, you know, like how to negotiate, like not wanting to elicit too much sympathy for her because she was also like very funny and charismatic. And then how to deal with Deutz. So as you said, you know, um, he, is a completely unlikable character. I mean, he was um, just, you know, a bad guy who was like really troubled person, I think. And um, who, you know, converted, did the thing that would cause like his, inflict maximal embarrassment and pain on his father um, by converting very publicly. And then, uh, you know, like kissing up to the Duchess, worming his way into her inner circle and then turning her into the government. Um, so that was a, a challenge, you know, and like, I think that especially as a Jewish historian, you know, there's, there's a tendency I would say in Jewish historiography to write about Jews who are either heroes or victims. I think it's rare. There are a couple of, you know, exceptions, but we're, you know, to focus on um, a scoundrel, you know, I mean, he was, he was a scoundrel. I tried to, to explain where I think he was coming from and to have some sympathy for him and to try to understand like what led to this. And, in a way, I tried to argue that um, his transformation, including his conversion, was sort of taking to a more extreme degree what um, all Jews were facing in France. So this was, you know, the moment that Jews were faced with unprecedented possibilities that they had never had before. And he, I think, you know, um, took, he, 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 transformed himself more than anyone else, but he was just carrying to an extreme, what I think a whole generation of Jews, the, the, the choices that they were facing. Um, but I also think that, um, you know, I think it's important to, to um, not just focus on heroes and victims um, when writing Jewish history. And, you know, what I eventually realized was that, um, Deutz, you know, was a bad guy, but so were a lot of people, you know, and why was it that he got, um, uh, that, that people were willing to see his bad deeds as a function of his Jewishness? And it was that connection, I think, that illuminated something about the origins of modern anti-Semitism. There were lots of bad people out there. So why was it that, that he, you know, people were so willing to see his badness as, 
as a Jewish uh, problem. And that's and that's what I think is interesting. Very interesting. And we have a question yeah. uh, from, a, from one um, member of the audience, Rochelle Gold, who's asking whether um, you see a parallel from that situation to the effect of people like Bernie Madoff or Jeffrey Epstein. And do you think yeah. this kind of dynamic is in play today? It's it's so interesting. And I, I feel like I have like there have been some people who've like danced around that issue, but it's it's still kind of a taboo thing to talk about, you know. In, Fascinating. In, yeah, in in um and you know, there have been these, you know, yeah, spectacularly bad <laughs> Jews in the last few years. And I feel like it's it's a really interesting topic. Like and what what I think was kind of striking was, you know, mostly there really was not that much anti-Semitic discourse in the United States around Madoff and Epstein. I kept mm -hmm. kind of waiting for there to be more, really. Um, and there really wasn't. And I think that says something about our current moment, not that it's, you know, perfect, but um, that this is this is different now, you know, luckily, at least for now. Um, well, we also don't see different different um, for a, a different, yeah. you know, discourse. Right, maybe uh, really, if you go on, you know, certain websites, yeah. there's a lot. There probably is, you know. Yeah. yeah, two really quick questions that we can knock off. Um, I imagine the answer is no. Is this case studied in school in France yet? No. In the way that you're presenting it? Well, now when you give, oh, no, that's not this book. But um, anyway, I'm sure you're putting it back on the map. And then uh, do you lecture about this in France? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, um, I was really struck by, like, um, you know, the leading... Um, uh, French Jewish historian Pierre Birnbaum like barely knew about this case, which is really, you know, kind of interesting in itself. I haven't actually given, um, uh, I don't think any talks about this in France. And the book did not, um, I think we approached some French publishers and there wasn't interest in it, which is, you know, kind of surprising. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, sorry. Let's go back to the father. So there's a, there's interest coming from the in the questions about what happened to uh, the chief rabbi Emmanuel uh, Joyce after this. And, yeah. and I also want to go back to the fascinating thing you said about the almost war that was caused by his using Yiddish. So anything you want to say about him? Yeah. So he is actually one of the um, most kind of noble or kind of good characters, I think, in the story, or the, one of the people I had the most sympathy for. Um, so he, he um, first of all, was um, this really kind of interesting rabbinical figure who was not like well known for publishing scholarly things, but he was well known for being um, a kind of man of the people and for being really close to his poorest um, uh, congregants at the time. And um, he, uh, and I think he, so his son, you know, first converts, creates a huge scandal, and then betrays the Duchess. And the Jewish community freaks out when this happens and thinks that, as I said, that there might be a pogrom. Um, he, they get, um, they, they, you know, completely wash their hands of um, Deutz through the figure of the kind of most prominent French Jew at the time was this guy, Adolphe Crémieux, who was a lawyer who would later become Minister of Justice in the Second Republic. Um, and you know, it was a very kind of important figure. He published, he kind of leaks an, a letter to Deutz completely um, disowning him, uh, kind of speaking on behalf of the Jewish community. Um, but the dad, the rabbi does not turn on his son and lets him stay with him, refuses. They try to get the, the so this is getting a little in the weeds, but one of the distinctive things about French Judaism is that it's um, there's it's under the control it was at the time under the control of the state and under the control of the Ministry of Religion that was a Napoleonic um, thing so he created the the consistoire the Jewish consistory which was a governmental body so um, that you know that the government exerted control over over Jewish religious practice and the uh, chief rabbi was answerable to the, the kind of board of directors of the consistoire. They completely turn on him 
and try to get him fired, even though he has a position for life. So they, they, they do, you know, I, I spent like a long time in the government, in the archives, reading the letters that were exchanged between Rabbi Deutz and the, um, the elected members of the consistoire. And they tried various things to, to get him fired. So first they tried to actually suppress his position and say like France doesn't need a chief rabbi. Um, they, we can just have the chief rabbi of Paris. That doesn't work. They try to, um, uh, they say that he can't attend meetings anymore unless he agrees to disown his son and to stop using his own name, Deutz, because it had been so yes. sullied by his son. He refuses that. Then, and then this is the interesting part for Yivo, I think, that they try to pass a rule saying that, or they do pass a rule saying that all sermons must be delivered in French. And the dad barely, uh, well, supposedly barely spoke French. Although interestingly, his letters um, to the consistory and to the minister of religion are in perfect French. So either he did in fact speak better French or could write it, or which is probably likely he had someone helping him uh, write those letters. Mm. So he did apparently like was able to make himself understood in French and did, you know, agree to give sermons in French, but it uh, it shows a kind of tension, I think, between these two currents that I alerted, alluded to in the talk within the Jewish community at the time of the kind of um, modernizers who were um, the, the wealthier members of the community who were kind of you know, rising up the, the social ladder and who wanted, um, as they wrote in a letter to the minister of religion, they wanted a chief rabbi who better represented their values and who better was a, a, a better spokesman for the direction that they felt Judaism should go in France. Whereas Rabbi Deutz was the old kind of Jew who was really more aligned with um, the Yiddish speaking Orthodox, um, you know, very observant uh, and poor um, uh, people who at that point were still the majority of the, the Parisian Jewish population, um, mm -hmm. soon to be no longer the case in the next decades. So I want to correct an earlier, thank you, earlier question from Rivka Augenfeld, which wasn't, do you speak in France, but can you give this lecture in French, for example, in Montreal? <laughs> um, I could, um, I would have to, I would have to uh, translate it in, <laughs> into French, okay. but yes, I, I could. So yeah. maybe you could be in, in touch there, Rivka, you can find um, Maury's email on on sure. the Yale website. And Jeffrey, I skipped you. Can I go back to Jeffrey Mallow? I apologize. We're now you have hearing. to unmute. Is he able to unmute? Tom, can you help? Unmute? Okay, I'm good. Um, I think you alluded to something that I know, which was the portrait of Deutz on the back of what I think was a very right-wing press. It was completely stereotypically Jewish. There's no way anybody looked like that, especially yeah. Deutz. Yeah. And so then, then I have another comment after you. Yeah. Um, well, so can we go back, Karen, to that slide um, of the picture of Deutz, like kind of halfway through? Let me see if I can get up there. Okay, so. Keep going. Yeah, it's that one. So um, now we don't have any photos of Deutz. Um, so we have a couple images and this is one, and this is um, the frontispiece of a violently anti-Semitic pamphlet attacking Deutz that was written by a mysterious person who claimed to have been a Jew who had converted to Catholicism, who grew up with Deutz and knew the family and then later converted. And it's a kind of like exposing how terrible he was. Uh, there's a strong possibility that this was actually the brother-in-law, um, David Drack, who had a kind of alter ego and published things under this false name of Morel. Um, and because the, the same guy kind of published defenses of Drack also. Um, 
anyway, that it's one kind of mystery of the case. I wasn't able to find any proof that Morel, this guy, Xavier Ignace Morel existed or under the Jewish names he claimed to have had. So this <laughs> image though is fascinating. Um, it's, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, is this an anti-Semitic image or not? Now we do have like, physical descriptions of Deutz that appeared in all the papers that described his swarthy complexion, um, his curly hair, his, you know, other things that are, you know, in this image. Now, on the one hand, you could say, like, I, I've shown this picture and people say, like, he, he looks black, you know, in this picture, like, was, you know, it, it's almost like a picture of someone with, of African ancestry. Um, but, you know, I think you could also, now, now there are a few other images, I don't have any for this talk, that are blatantly anti-Semitic, that show him as this like kind of tiny, almost like pygmy-like, you know, character, whereas this, I don't think is that, you know, this is a relatively, um, you know, he, he he's, you know, sort of well-dressed, he's not um, in he has a kind of somewhat dignified expression. Um, you could imagine a much more anti-Semitic image than this. So it's it's really hard to know. Was this without having a picture of him? Was this actually what he looked like, or you know, is this um, taking certain racial typologies of of Jews, which were kind of just at this very moment, I think, really coming into the mainstream? Uh, and, you know, uh, creating, um, you know, uh, an image that is supposed to kind of, you know, typify the, the Jew. Of course, this kind of, you know, image would become the, the racial typology of Jews in France and, and would, you know, be, you know, used by anti-Semites for, for decades to come. So um, anyway, it's, I think that's a, a kind of fascinating question. I don't know if I answered your Question. You said you had another comment? Yes, it's just very tangential. But after the Dreyfus trial, it didn't let up. When Marie Curie was called out for, uh, for an illegitimate, uh, an adulterous affair, the yellow press uh, described her, among other things, as a Jewess, hmm. which for sure she, she wasn't. Was not. <laughs> yeah, she was not. Right. I mean, it, it's fascinating that Dreyfus, you know, the, like a, a lot of people have studied images of Dreyfus. I'm actually writing a, a biography of Dreyfus now for the Jewish Live series um, uh, at Yale uh, University Press. And, you know, I've been looking at different caricatures of Dreyfus from the time who, you know, really, you know, to my eyes did not conform to Jewish stereotype, you know, type had like, you know, um, blue eyes and not, you know, um, but he was depicted in, you know, all kinds of, you know, grotesque uh, images at, at the time. So this, you know, became a kind of, you know, technique of anti-Semitism using these, this visual typology to um, depict Jews. I'm going to jump to some questions um, about Deutz later in life. So uh, what is the evidence of his death happening in New Orleans? And would you yeah. say something more about uh, his later years and why you have doubts about his final days? So yeah, yeah. so this is, as I said, um, there are a couple mysteries that I think remain from this story. One of them being who was the father of the Duchess's uh, second child? Um, so, or not second, I guess, third child, the, the baby she had um, in prison. Um, that is a kind of mystery that I go into in the book. I won't um, give it away here. But the other one is really what became of Deutz. And there were, in the 19th century, various uh, rumors that circulated and that we find in, in some of the sources. Um, so one of them was that he, you know, died in, in misery and, and poverty um, in, in France. Um, having blown through all the money. Um, and there are a couple of letters from after um, the betrayal by Deutz that we, we have. So he petitions, forget how many years later, um, I think in like 1840 or 1841 or something, he petitions Louis Philippe uh, he, he, like for a handout. He wants more money. And he says, you know, I 
you know, defended your throne and now I've come upon hard times, even though he'd gotten 500,000 francs and he basically is asking for a job or a, a handout. Um, and um, he says he spent all his money caring, caring for his, you know, family, which is completely untrue. Um, so this, uh, there are, there's one scholar who wrote a short article on this case that's very good. This guy, he's the archivist at the Jewish consistory in Paris. Um, this guy, Philippe Landau. Um, it, so it's like a 10 page article. And this was really the only kind of good thing written about the case. He found, and it's, it's you know, amazing in the archive of, I think the foreign ministry of France, um, a set of letters between um, the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the ambassador uh, to um, the United States, uh, or the kind of consul in New Orleans, the French consul in New Orleans. <clears throat> and um, in these letters, they want, they've heard rumors that Deutz died, <coughs> excuse me, in New Orleans, and they want confirmation of it. And it seems that these rumors that he had died got back to the family. And I think they were trying to settle um, his share of the father's estate. And in fact, I, I looked at the notary records when the dad died and um, Simon was there for like one thing, but then not thereafter. And it seems like that's probably when he left for New Orleans. So um, the consul, um, in New Orleans can't find any proof that he had died and then writes back and says, actually, we have a testimony by this banker, Michel Heine, um, who later went on to, you know, found one of the most important French banks. Um, his daughter, um, Alice Heine, became like the princess of Monaco um, later. So very important French bankers who testified to having known Deutz, who died under a false name, Sylvain de la Tour, which has the same initials, SD. Um, and they basically, so, so Landau, the guy who wrote this one article, concludes that that must be what happened, that, that Deutz died under this false name in New Orleans in 1844. But I kept, digging and I couldn't find any burial record of anyone named Sylvain de la Tour um, or Simon Deutz for that matter. Um, I looked up, um, you know, Jewish burial records. So he, uh, they claimed that he died in the house of someone named Weil, W-E-I-L. Um, and that's who um, the French government was paying this kind of small allowance to, um, which they probably, that was the deal probably that he, they would pay the allowance if he left France. Um, so it seems like he was in a kind of Jewish milieu around like the Heines and the, and the Wiles, this kind of like Alsatian French Jewish milieu, which was, um, you know, um, many of the Jews in New Orleans were from this kind of French speaking um, world of Alsace. Um, so it seems likely that he would have had a Jewish burial if they knew who he was um, then. Oh, and I should, I, I neglected to say that he converted back to Judaism. So one other, um, uh, I forgot to mention this in the talk, we do have proof that after the betrayal, he moved to London for a while. And in the records of the Great Synagogue of London, there's a Hebrew record from the, the um, uh, chief rabbi of, of England saying that I have this day recorded the return to Judaism of my colleague Menachem Mendel, who was Emmanuel Deutz, um, rabbi of Paris. So he did, you know, I, he probably did it because he did everything thinking how he could get ahead. And I think he thought at that point that um, he had like maybe the Jewish community would protect him because he was so hated after this. So, but anyway, so it seems likely he would have had a Jewish burial and I found no um, record of this in the in the um, records of the Jewish synagogues and there weren't many um, in New Orleans at the time. So, you know, I think it's possible that he just 
like vanished and that it's possible that he, you know, his name, you know, his reputation followed him and who knows what other, I did find one possible lead, which was a loan that he had made to someone. Um, there's a record of someone named Simon De, but it, D-E-U, but if you look at the actual thing, it, it, looks like it could be Deutz having made in New Orleans alone to someone. But I think it's possible that he just vanished and in, you know, under a false name in America um, at the time. So I, I want to hold that possibility open. Um, uh, you must have had such a fat, it, it can see the excitement that you, you still comes off of you doing this research. There's a question from Gudalina Novitsky. Oh, we got to unmute. Hold on. Uh, Tom, can you help? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Maurice, this is really, really very nice and detailed lecture about the roots of anti-Semitism. We all know what Germans, uh, Bosches, like they call them in France, they did, uh, how they behaved. But the most important thing that Jews were betrayed by France, by French people. Velodrome, I know one lady, she's a pretty old lady, who escaped from Velodrome. She talked about this in Holocaust Museum. And uh, my question is, how come that all Jews were expelled from France, I mean, from military zone of France to Ashwenshim, how come by uh, police, uh, gendarmes from France, how come they accepted and like Jean-Marie Lustiger, who was Jewish and Archbishop of France and Jean uh, Paul Pope, he was promoted him. How come they accept, accepted him? He's mm -hmm. Jewish, you know. Yeah. Thank you for your an answer. Yeah, so I mean, that that's a big part of the story is um, the um, Catholic, church's responsibility for anti-Semitism in, in France. And it, it's a complicated, long history, obviously, but that goes through a big change in the period that I'm studying, so in the 19th century. And this was, you know, it's important to keep in mind just how radical the French Revolution was in expelling the, the, the Catholic Church. Um, I mean, you know, it's hard to conceive of, but they, they did. So, you know, the church lost, you know, its power during the French Revolution. Priests were forced underground. Many of them were killed. So this period of the restoration, beginning in 1815, the church is trying to recover its authority and power in France. And meanwhile, all their land had been confiscated by the revolution. And um, so they're trying to recover uh, in this period. And one of the ways they seek to do it is through high profile conversions um, of not just Jews, but Protestants. And so in the Catholic newspapers at the time, they would boast in every issue of who were the, the high profile Jews and Protestants they had managed to convert. There weren't many. As I said, there were only like five conversions a year in this period, but there was a kind of spate, a kind of wave of um, high profile conversions among very elite Jews, um, including, for instance, a little bit later, I mentioned Adolphe Crémieux, who was the kind of most famous, most prominent Jew at the time, his wife and, and children converted. Um, uh, and so there were these kind of high profile conversions of whom the children of the, you know, Simon Deutz and his brother-in-law were, were, you know, the among the most uh, prominent and scandalous. So there was that element, um, this kind of like effort by the Catholic Church to kind of, you know, regain authority. And I think that, you know, we see that, um, you know, for the next 150 years. So there's this, you know, there, there are other scandals. So for instance, you know, in Italy, there's the Mortara affair, which is kind of similar where, um, you know, this Jewish child is kind of secretly baptized and then the church won't return him. And then as, as um, you mentioned in World War II, you know, the church, several, um, there, there are many cases of Jewish children who were saved by hiding in Catholic institutions. 
and being converted. And then after the war, um, often their families were not able to recover them. And so there was a famous case of the Finale children who the church wouldn't um, relinquish after the war. Um, there is the, you know, also a pretty famous case of the great Holocaust historian, Saul Friedlander, who wrote, and I, I can't recommend this enough, he wrote a beautiful memoir called When Memory Comes. In French, it's Quand vient le souvenir about um, his kind of memory. He was a hidden child in a Catholic religious institution and became an ardent Catholic. And then his kind of reconversion back to Judaism after the war. So this is a story that was repeated. And as you mentioned, one of the most famous cases is the um, Lustiger, who was another, had a similar story, who was saved by a Catholic institution and then became Archbishop of, um, of Paris after the war. He spoke Yiddish. I mean, he was open about his Jewish background, um, but he stayed a, a kind of religious Catholic uh, after the war. So this is like a story that, you know, people don't like to tell very much about, you know, Catholicism's um, imbrication in anti-Semitism. I would say one more thing, which is that, interestingly, though, during the betrayal of the Duchess, the Catholic newspapers who were, you know, like would brag about every conversion, they, unlike the other right-wing newspapers, didn't, were not the most anti-Semitic because they actually refrained from calling Deutz a Jew. Whereas the other, the real right-wing anti-Semitic newspapers had no problem calling him a Jew, even though he had converted. The Catholic newspapers couldn't do that. They had to kind of acknowledge that he was now Catholic. Um, and so the, this, where the other ones just saw, this is, you know, they saw Judaism as a racial um, characteristic, even if they might not have used that term, but it certainly wasn't something that you could convert out of for them. Um, so we formally wrap up at around 3.15 and there's a question I'm gonna take from Dee Strauss. Um, yes, yes. I'm, I'm muted. And then, and if there's one more, we can, we can do that as well. Go ahead. Yes. I am wondering during Leon Bloom's time, was the Stoitz business brought up? Yeah, so um, uh, definitely. So Leon Bloom for, for other people was the first uh, Jewish um, prime minister or kind of head of government in, in France and who comes to power in 1936 and, uh, you know, elicits like a huge um, anti-Semitic response. Um, and um, so I, one of the things I do in one of the later chapters of the book is trace the kind of ups and downs of the way the story is told use, using tools of digital humanities by you can um, actually, you know, just search how many references there are in databases of French newspapers at the time and there or, or through history. And there was a huge uh, surge in references to the case uh, during World War II, as I mentioned in the talk. Um, and, you know, that was part of, you know, the kind of um, French fascist um, drive to um, uh, justify their actions by proving that the Jew is an inherent traitor. Um, and of course, you know, Leon Blum was, you know, tarred with that brush also, you know, was considered, you know, he was, you um, you know, like the, the kind of ministers of the Third Republic were seen as having sold out France as having been traitors in that, in that lineage also. Maureen, this is so fascinating. I love the way you talk about it. We're, we're filled up um, and we have to get you back maybe to talk about the uh, le, le droit à la différence if, if we can. I know you, you're busy. Um, yeah. So I want to thank you so much for opening the story up. I put a link to the seminary co-op because I wanted to encourage all of you to order this if you decide to from a local bookstore. Um, and that's that's ours down here in Hyde yeah, but Park. The book is available, you know, on the Basic Books website, Amazon, any other. Everywhere. There, get it it's anywhere. available yeah. everywhere. But yeah. that's why I popped. Uh, but yeah, support your there. local bookstore. Then. Let's go. Thank you. I'm so glad Thank so you. many of you could make it.
Um, and um, sometimes we stick around uh, for a few minutes for informal talk afterwards. More, I don't know if you have time or. Yeah, I I, I should probably go, but I want to okay, say. Great. Thank you to all of you. Um, yeah, this was really interesting. And thank you to Karen for, for asking questions and for organizing and inviting me. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Maury. Thank you everyone again for coming and, um, and, and, Evo, and Evo folks for making this possible. Okay. Bye. Take care, everybody. Good luck in France, Maury. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna close out now. Oh, Tom, I'm gonna let you close out.